Welcome to the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Rosensweet, mom of three young people, peaceful parenting coach, and your cheerleader and guide on all things parenting. Each week, we'll cover the tools, strategies, and support you need to end the yelling and power struggles and encourage your kids to listen and cooperate so that you can enjoy your family time. I'm happy to say we have a great relationship with our three kids. The teen years have been easy and joyful, not because we're special unicorns, but because my kids were raised with peaceful parenting. I've also helped so many parents just like you stop struggling and enjoy their kids again. I'm excited to be here with you today and bring you the insight and information you need to make your parenting journey a little more peaceful. Let's dive into this week's conversation. Hey y'all, welcome back to another episode of the Peaceful Parenting Podcast. Today's episode is a coaching episode with Andrea. Andrea is the mom of two kids, a five-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl, and she wanted some support, especially around her five-year-old boy who is very intense and sensitive, and Andrea was just feeling really alone and not sure what to do when challenging things came up with her son, and she felt pretty overwhelmed by his by his challenges and his, his big feelings. So we worked on some strategies for that, and of course, make sure you stick around to part two where we checked in a month later and heard how things were for her and and we also tweaked some of the things that were coming up inside of her when her son was being challenging and I think she found that really helpful and and went away with even more confidence and compassion for herself and for her son before we jump into the coaching episode I just wanted to let you know I have a new free how to stop yelling at your kids course It is available if you go to sarahrosensweet.com, yelling. You can sign up for free. It's a three-week email, do it on your own time-based course. It is really, really thorough and it works if you follow it. So if you have challenges with staying calm, even if you're not full-on yelling, but you find yourself often getting annoyed or frustrated, this course is going to walk you through how to identify your triggers, how to work on those triggers, how to stay calm, even when things are really hard. And we know that that's the first step of peaceful parenting, right? Is that we need to learn how to calm ourselves so that we can respond to our child when things are hard rather than react out of anger or frustration or annoyance. So go to sarahrosensweet.com forward slash yelling and you can sign up for how to stop yelling at your kids. Okay, let's meet Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yeah, it's a pleasure. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Andrea. I have two small kids. I have Emmett, who just recently turned five, and Holly, who's two years old. Okay, how can I support you today? Um, so I'm ca- I'm calling or I'm seeking your advice because Emmett, the five year old, has like pretty big emotions and behaviors that I find overwhelming a lot of the time. Like I think he's a pretty intense kid. <laughs> yeah. And when I, whenever I'm like with my friends who have kids or other kids, I always feel like Emmett stands out as being pretty intense. And uh, yeah, and I just struggle with how to deal with him in like at home but also in like outside situations where I feel like I'm being watched by other parents and that's so hard yeah I think it's important to also let our listeners know and to remind ourselves that Emmett just turned five right yeah like a few like a few days ago ago. (laughs) yeah at this taping so he's very newly five and just turned five is a lot different than five almost six so let's just let's remind ourselves that for all practical purposes he's almost still four Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So tell me a little bit about maybe some examples of this the intensity that that you see in him. So I think what I think what makes it so challenging is that it's so unpredictable. Like so I'm going to give you an example from yesterday. We went I went and picked him up at school. He, so this is the other thing is he just just started school. So that's another big transition for him, but I mean this behavior is like you know, has been going on for a while. But so I went to pick up him from school. And then we went to pick up Holly at the daycare. And we were on our bikes and he put his bike next to the fence. So we could go in and get Holly. Then we came out, it was all fine. And then he was struggling to get his bike off the fence. And I said, Oh, can I help you? So, you know, I picked up his bike, turned it around and onto the sidewalk. And, and he was like, No, I wanted you to back my bike up this way like just like so like just lost it so upset that I didn't 
remove his bike the way he wanted. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. like, it's just just these things that, like, I cannot anticipate when he's going to get upset because it makes no sense to me. Like, mm-hmm. another example is, like, you know, opening the car door when he wants to do it himself. Or, like, and, you know, I, tr- I like, in that instance, I, I might try and ask beforehand, like, do you want to open it or do you want me to? So I can understand, like, Maybe that's maybe not the best example, but just things like that, where it's like pouring the milk the wrong way or just things that just don't make sense, you know? And it's like, he gets so overly upset <laughs> about these things. Yeah. And he, he like sticks with it. Like, why did you do that? Like, it, yeah. How, how, and how do you typically respond? Let's go back to the example from yesterday when he, when you, when you moved his bike wrong. Right. I I just I think yesterday I just said, you know what, Emmett, I was helping you and this is the way that was easiest for me to do it. Like, I didn't I can't like I sometimes I say I'll say something like I can't read your mind unless you tell me what you want, then I don't know how you want me to do it. And this is what I decided to do since I'm the one doing it, that kind of thing. Like, how did that go over for him? I think he's yeah, he, he it doesn't really calm him down at all. It doesn't really help help soothe him. He's just like, "Well, I, why didn't you? like he'll still go on for a while about like the fact that I didn't back his bike up the way he was expecting or something." And yeah, it's just hard because it it just it's hard to, to get him down from that. And it also kind of will like make me frustrated and then make me more impatient just cuz I like like why can't he get over this? You know, once, once like, we had that incident with the bike yesterday, then it's, like, everything afterwards is, like, more challenging and charged because he's had this, like, intense moment that he hasn't been able to, like, move past. And, like, he did eventually get out of it, but I think what happened is we ended up going to the front of the building and he saw, like, a friend that he, he was He got mistaken. distracted. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he will eventually sometimes get out of it, but oftentimes it just, like, lingers for a long time. And it's, mm-hmm. like, it's hard for me to, like, understand what is going on and how to how to bring him back. And- okay. So, I mean, a couple things. One is it sounds like sometimes these things happen when you you say it's unpredictable. It's probably when his resources are low or he has the, you know, full emotional backpack because he's tired from first day of school or the beginning of school or whatever. Right. So that's pretty common and typical for a five-year-old to have, mm-hmm. have those kind of things. So sometimes it's like the thing is not the thing. Like it's just the, it's just the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. Mm-hmm. So, what you're doing is sort of trying to be logical with him and sort of explain and rationalize, right? But it's not really anything that that he's responding to out of logic in the first place. Like it's just yeah. it's just a feeling that he's having. And what I would suggest to you is that you drop the the logic and you just go straight to the to the feeling. And this is the thing with with empathizing. Like if you can just empathize with him. And you said, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that he's upset that you moved his bike wrong. But it's, you know, he's five. He's powerless. He has possibly a full backpack or he's just a sensitive guy. And he has this idea in his head. And the thing that you did didn't match the idea in his head. And it's just too much for him to deal with in that moment, right? right yeah. So it sounds like, you know, explaining doesn't generally work, or at least it didn't in the example that you gave from yesterday. So why don't we just not explain unless you really think that that there's an information gap that needs to be closed. But it sounds like that that's sort of been your go-to in trying to help him feel better is to try and explain why you you did something. I want to use an adult example to sort of um to show you how this might work. So let's pretend that you have a lucky shirt that you like to wear for your all of your important business meetings and I'm your partner and you ask me to to pick up your lucky shirt from the dry cleaner. And I came home that night and and you said, oh, did you get my shirt? And I said, oh, no, I forgot. Right. And you said, but you said you were going to get my shirt. And I was like, oh, you know, come on, Andrea, it's just a shirt. You, right. you don't really, you don't really need it. Okay. How, how would you feel? Yeah, I would feel, I guess, like my partner wasn't listening to me or like wasn't, didn't have the same importance of of the thing is I was yeah I wasn't understanding it from your point of view right yeah and and I think that we can agree that that's a pretty good synonymous example to like moving the bike wrong right like it Mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to me that you need this lucky shirt for your work presentation but it's it's important to you and what if instead when I came home and you said you have my shirt and I said oh I know I forgot it I'm so sorry I know how important that is to you 
Okay. I see the difference. <laughs> yeah. So just, okay. You might still be upset that I didn't pick up your shirt, but right. at least you would feel understood and maybe you would you would be able to, you know, let go of some of your upset about it. Okay. Yeah, because what I've been doing is I've been I've been trying to say, like, I can't. I can't read your mind. And I do this thing with him where I'm like, I'm thinking of a number. Try and guess what number I'm thinking of. And then he can't get it. And I say, oh, look, you, you don't know what number I'm thinking of because you can't read my mind. And I can't read your mind when you – so I – but – so maybe that's not the best. Well, if it worked, I would say it was fine. But it sounds like he still continues to feel misunderstood yeah. when he has these big upsets. So so – it, it's true you can't read his mind, and it also doesn't matter because you can just respond to the feeling of that he's having, which is disappointment that you moved his bike wrong, which is just like if I had responded to the disappointment that you didn't, that I didn't pick up your shirt from the dry cleaner. So it wasn't what you wanted, or it wasn't what you expected, or I moved the bike wrong. And I think there's a level of complication because in the you know some of the questions that. I, that you had written answers for me before we came on the podcast together, you said that you're a really sensitive person. And so I think sometimes for sensitive people, I think that sometimes we feel like we want to defend ourselves against the upset because the upset can be like contagious, like like it's upsetting for us when our child is upset also. Right. So not only I think is it important to remember to you know try to empathize with Emmett and say things like, oh, this isn't what you wanted or this isn't what you expected or this is so disappointing, or, you know, whatever, you don't have to say too much. And mm-hmm. and mostly it's about saying that little bit and then letting him have his feelings. But at the same time, giving yourself a big dose of compassion of right. like, oh, this is so hard when my kid is upset with me, because I moved his bike wrong. You know, anyone would feel upset when something like this happens. Right. And then like, I guess, one thing that he does a lot is he's like, why, why, why? Like he really wants the why. So yeah, I, I'm not well, sure. I mean, I can see, I think your family must be fairly intellectual because you <laughs> were talking about how you, you know, explain things to him and, and you, you approach this like with this logic and the intellect. And that's what he's been trained to, to go to when he's upset is the why. Okay. So I wonder if that might reduce when you stop trying to explain things so much. Okay. Uh-huh. I'm not saying withhold information from him. Like, I hope right. that's clear. I'm just saying right. it's not about the the reason. Like, like if you were upset because I didn't pick up your dry cleaning, would you have cared if I had like five reasons of, you know, why I didn't get it and something happened at work and blah, blah, blah? Or would you just want to hear, I'm really sorry that I disappoint, that you're disappointed and you don't have your shirt? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if he says, why, why, you might just say something like, oh, sweetheart, I'm not sure there's an answer to that. Okay. It's just the it's just the way I did it, or it's just okay. the way it is. It's hard, and then I would go back to empathizing. It's hard when it doesn't go the way you want it to go, okay. or it's too disappointing when it doesn't go the way you want it to go. Right. Okay. And you can say things like, "Sometimes we just don't know why." Okay. You know, turn him into a little philosopher. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and I guess I often feel like, like I was mentioning, I often feel like pressure you know when I'm when there are other people around or something I find it harder but I I, I think that's probably a universal feeling for for parents yeah and you know what I want to share a, a lovely story that that a client shared with me once that she was at the park with her kids and she was trying to leave and her three-year-old was having a massive tantrum he was in the wagon and he kept throwing things out of the wagon as she was like walking out of the park and she kept having to stop and pick them up and put them back in and he's screaming his head off and she saw a man from across the park staring at her. She was like, oh, no. You know, not only is this horrible, difficult situation, but now this guy's judging me and staring at me. And just then he called out, you're doing a great job. Oh, right. <laughs> so, so we can't always assume that people are, are judging us negatively. And right. most of the time people have been there. And right. also most, there, there may be some times where people are judging you. And in that, in those moments, whether you know if they're judging you or not judging you, or if you're afraid they're judging you, you remind yourself, my loyalty here is to Emmett and mm-hmm. his big feelings. Yeah. And you can even use that, the self-compassion phrase of, I'm worthy and lovable, even though my child is having a meltdown on the sidewalk because I moved his bike wrong. Okay. Uh-huh. And especially if you're sensitive, that's going to be really important to be giving yourself that compassion when things are hard. Because mm-hmm. you're going to feel it more deeply than somebody else might if their kid's having a meltdown on the sidewalk. 
And he's like you, right? He's having a meltdown on the sidewalk because he feels things more deeply than some other children might. Yeah, I think I think he's highly sensitive mm-hmm. as well, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is a, a blessing and a curse, I imagine. It <laughs> is, for sure. I mean, you know it. Yeah, I'll try to empathize more and logic less. A bit. Yeah. Um, Can you, do you remember what it was like when you were growing up? Because I remember you, you wrote to me that, that you were really the only sensitive person in your family and you didn't really feel like, you didn't feel very understood. Mm-hmm. Can you remember any incidents where you think, oh, I, I wish that, they had responded to me like this instead of that. Cause maybe you can use that mm-hmm. when Emmett's having a hard time. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard for me. I think I've always had, like I have an older sister and I think that we have a good relationship, but I think I've always been a little bit jealous of her as the younger sibling. And like, so I think that I always had this, like, yeah, I just looked up to her in this way and I always felt like inadequate compared to her. And yeah, my family, they're not uh, super in tune with like <laughs> that, I think. So it wasn't very supportive, but I think even as an adult, I, I, I often get labeled as like, they they will outright label me as like, oh, you're being too sensitive for whatever, right. you know, and like, you know, I'm always the one who calls out like, you know, if someone's being a bit racist or like those types of things. And and it's because I'm the sensitive one. So yeah, I don't know if, uh, I mean, those are like more recent adult issues, but I don't know if it applies. Well, I mean, those, both of those things would cause some suffering for you. And I think that that adds a level of fear when you're when you're dealing with Emmett. Like oh, I don't want him to, I don't want him to go through what I went through, mm-hmm. right? And there's nothing that you can really do to change somebody's temperament, but right. there's a lot that you can do to make them feel that it's okay to have the feelings that they have, right. and to to validate his feelings and validate his emotions. And you know that's something that probably would have been nice for you, and still would be nice for you if if people in your family were were more validating and didn't tell you that you were overreacting or that you were too sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, just to finish up talking about that, you know, his big feelings, I think we also have to remember that he's really, his his brain is really still immature and Mm -hmm. he's got very little impulse control because of where he's at with his brain development. His feelings are big. He doesn't have, you know, too much logic or perspective in life right now when when he gets hijacked by those big feelings of disappointment. So really it's it's very normal. You know, it's very mm-hmm. normal to it, it, it's definitely on the outlier edge of the continuum of big feelings, but it's very normal. Okay. He's he's a sensitive guy, he's got big feelings, he's still little. Yeah. And the more that you can just practice welcoming the feelings and by empathizing with him and showing him that you understand and really just trying to ride it out while still taking care of yourself and, you know, reminding yourself that your loyalty is to him. And, you know, of course, this is hard. Anyone in in my position would find this difficult and you can handle it also. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's good. That's helpful. Thank you. And there are people who will never understand. There are people who just have kids who don't have as big of feelings, who are much more easygoing, yeah. who don't, you know, who don't get fussed by things. Totally. Yeah. I feel like uh, my, my mom, you know, and my sister, like, I just feel like a lot of people are like, why is he so like reactive? Like, why yeah. is he like this? And I, and I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I just, well, well, let's come yeah. up with a Let's come up with like a catchphrase that you can say when they're questioning it. You can right. say something like, ah, that's just Emmett. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And I, yeah, I just like, I fear cause, cause I feel like, as we mentioned, I feel like I've been labeled as like overly sensitive and I fear him being labeled. I don't want him to have a label that like. Yeah. Um, well, there's a big difference between sensitive and overly sensitive. Right. Yeah. Right. There's, you know, he's a sensitive guy. Mm-hmm. And if anyone says, well, he's overly sensitive, I think you can say everyone has a right to their feelings. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm taking notes while we talk. Sure. So. <laughs> it, it's hard to be a deep feeler. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll talk again in a few weeks and see how it went. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'll talk to you in a few weeks. Hi, Andrea. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How have things been going? We talked four weeks ago, and how have things been going with Emmett? 
It's been it's been okay. Like I think that I've seen I've seen some improvements in some areas and not, not in others. But so what have you done? What have you done differently, or what have you worked on since we talked? So I think the the one thing that like really I've noticed a change is when um, like you suggested because he was always asking for explanations, like why, and you suggested just saying like something like I I don't have an answer or you know, something along those lines. And I think that's helped the most. I think he's able to like accept it, whatever the situation is. Yeah, we talked about you not using so much logic and, you know, head heady explanations and just letting him be upset about things. Yeah. So what I've been doing is I've just been explaining the reasoning behind whatever decision. And then if he still doesn't accept it and he asks why, I've been saying, you know, Emmett, I've already told you, I don't have any other answer than what I've already told you, that kind of thing. Great. And he seems to calm down a bit more quickly this way. <laughs> That's good. Have you been have you been working on really trying to lean into the empathy? I mean, I see those two things as, you know, almost almost opposite. Like the the explanations are sort of like you know, okay, if I explain it, then then you'll understand you won't be upset anymore. And it can seem counterintuitive to lean into the upset. But how, how has that been for you? I think that, uh, yeah, I think I've been more empathetic. And I think that like, I, I can also like, recognize, you know, when his, when his resources might be low and why that is. Mm-hmm. I think I, I, in the past, I've been kind of hard line on like food, for example. So like, you know, I try to do the division of responsibility. So we're going to eat at these times and you can eat whatever you want. But he often wants food outside of those times. So I, I recognize that now as like, he maybe just needs food <laughs> and like, mm-hmm. to like be more flexible about that. And I think that that's helped. And I think that, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, we're still having certain challenges. And I think he has kind of an intense way of being (laughs) yeah yeah um but I'm able to like just like give him more kind of I don't know grace or whatever in like those difficult moments and I love that I love what you're saying about grace about giving him more grace and I think last time we also talked about giving yourself some more grace when he's upset because I think that was triggering for you when he was upset because it brought up all the times when you were upset when you were a kid and you didn't feel like anyone ever understood yeah. And I think that I'm I I think that I'm able to do that. Like I'm able to say like this is hard, like this is a challenging situation. The thing that I still struggle with though is like translating that into feeling okay about it or whatever. And again, I think I like tend to over intellectualize things, but I I can understand it as being challenging, but then it still doesn't make me like I still feel like like ugh, <laughs> you know. Like you wish it weren't or say, say more about that. I guess like, so the other day at school, he like, I asked him to pick up his backpack before going into the building or whatever. And he was like, no, I want you to get it, whatever. And I was like, oh man, like we're having these kind of struggles again. And like in that context, all of the other parents were around, all of the other kids were around, it was school drop off. So it was like, I was feeling you know, I have this, like, this problem with just feeling judged externally. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, man, like, I don't want, my initial fear was that these other parents who were just starting to get to know are going to see this and say, oh, he's a bad kid. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want you to be friends with this kid because he's, like, has these behaviors that are challenging. So that was my, like, initial thing. And I was like, oh, no, (laughs) like, I want, I want Emmett to like, you know, start off on the right foot. And, um, but then I also feel like the, the judgment. And so in that moment I was like, okay, this is challenging. Like this is a hard situation. I can recognize that it's challenging for me, but then I guess it's the next step of like, after I recognize that, what then, you know, like, is it supposed to help me? Uh, Yeah. I guess I just, I I guess that's a question for you. Like what is the, so if I, if I give myself empathy, what is the outcome of that? Right. So it's the it's sort of the antidote to the fear and shame that you feel in those okay. moments uh-huh. when you feel like the other people are judging you. And they might be and they might not be. And some of them might be and some of them might not be. Right. And I guess, you know, in terms of the fear thing, would you really want to be friends with people who didn't have a level of compassion for your kid? 
I mean, right. that's that's one thing I guess I would sort of ask myself. And then the other part of it is for the for that shame trigger is that you feel, you know, oh, my kid is bad, you know, quote, bad, and I must be doing something wrong or a bad parent or whatever. So the key here is to disconnect his behavior from your worthiness as a person. So the phrase that you want to say to yourself after you recognize that this is hard, which is great that you've gone to that first level, but then the next step is, even though he's melting down and yelling at me to pick up his backpack, I'm still worthy and lovable. Right. And that yeah. and that's hard when we're conditioned. We really are conditioned everywhere to connect our productivity and our our the things that we make with our worthiness and lovability, right? Or the yeah. things that we do with our worthiness and lovability. But we have to remember that we're born worthy and lovable. Like no yeah. child is born and has to earn their worthiness and lovability. It's only through life that we that we for, we forget that and we're taught differently than that. So it's coming back to even though I've got this kid who's like lying on the ground and yelling at me to pick up his backpack. And by the way, I would just pick up his backpack. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, okay, sweetheart, I'll carry it for you or or whatever. Like, is that the hill you want to die on? Yeah. Um, like who's going to carry the backpack into the classroom? And he will someday be horrified at the thought of you carrying his backpack for him. Like, right. you know, <laughs> it's just not yet. But really just remind yourself that even though this is happening, I'm still worthy and lovable. And my child's behavior is not a reflection on me as a person. So right. it's it's letting both of those things stand yeah. together. I think that's where I really struggle because I, I often think like, yeah, I get into that like, what am I doing wrong? Like, why is this like? So I think that's where I struggle. Yeah. Listen, there's always there are always tweaks that we can make that can help things be easier and and, you know, that the, all of the things that you're already doing that you learn to you know, empathize with him and not do the over explaining and being a little bit more flexible. We, there are always things that we can do. And if we have an intense, sensitive child, we're never going to get to the point where like it's a walk in the park with an intense, sensitive five-year-old. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes I, yeah, sometimes I feel like quite alone, but because he is very, I think very intense. And I also, I also realize that, like, when he's at school, he's, a, like, you know, good and, like, able to follow instructions. And, like, I feel like, like, I, you know, I feel like this is his release around me in particular, mm -hmm. like, less so with my partner, still to some degree with him as well. But I think with me in particular, he's really, like, he can get really defiant and demanding, I guess. But it's so, so common. Yeah. And that, you know, and that defiance and the demandingness, demandingness, is that a word? Is are those are those are really signs of a full emotional backpack that yeah. he's, you know, he has held it all together at school all day. I don't know if you've heard me talk about the Coke bottle analogy or if you've ever seen that floating around the internet. So, no. so there was a really wonderful, you know, essay or blog post or something that this mom had written about, you know, imagine your child is like a Coke, a Coke bottle or a pop bottle and the lid's on and they go to school and, you know, one, a little thing happens and they manage and they keep it together, but it's like the, the bottle has gotten one shake and then something else happens and they manage and they keep it together, but then the bottle, you know, gets two more shakes right. and all day long, the internal pressure is building up. Right. Um, and then when they see you at the end of the day, the lid comes off the pop bottle and it's messy and, you know, pop goes everywhere. Yeah. But, and, and that's similar to the idea that where we talk about in peaceful parenting of the emotional backpack, that kids hold on to everything in their bodies, which is the Coke bottle or the backpack until they feel safe. And, you know, I don't mean literally safe, but when you're loving presence and you're, you know, the person who he loves most in the world is there that lid comes off, right? Or those right. feelings come up out of the backpack. And when before the lid comes off, you see this sort of this in this attempt to sort of keep it all together still is that demandingness and bossiness and controlling behavior. So yeah. it's it's natural, it's normal. It happens to every sensitive, intense kid, and even yeah. some that are just average if they have a hard day. Yeah, yeah. And when I say a hard day, I don't mean that like things are going badly for him at kindergarten. It's just all of the normal things that happen throughout the day. He's away from you. You know, maybe, you know, the teacher didn't listen when he wanted to do something or maybe his friend didn't want to sit next to him. Like all of those normal things and just navigating life as a five-year-old in school will contribute to a full backpack. 
Yeah, it's helpful for sure to have the this is normal <laughs> message because yeah. it doesn't always seem that way. Well, but. so you've heard me say before, I think about the 20% and the 80% of kids, yeah. right? Like those 20% of kids, like you might feel alone, but you certainly are not alone. If you go yeah. into my Facebook group, if you like come into my membership, if you were like, you know, a fly on the wall in my coaching calls, there's so many parents of kids who, just like you who have these same fears and doubts and struggles. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Well, keep me, keep me posted, keep it up and know that, you know, he's only five now as he gets older, he will, I mean, he's still going to be your sensitive, intense kid, but he will smooth out. Right. I've yeah. seen it happen where kids right. who are, when they're little, they have so little self-regulation and so little self-control. And as they get older, their brain gets more developed. They have more experience. They have more perspective and yeah. they do smooth out. It's not always going to be this hard. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think I've heard people, like I'm thinking my friends in particular, say like oftentimes at five, it just becomes so much easier. And so I was kind of like... <laughs> oh my gosh, we had a conversation yesterday in my membership about five-year-olds. Like there were like three or four questions from members about five-year-olds. And then this other member who was on who said she earlier, she had said she didn't have a question, but then she said, actually, I do have a question. What is it with five-year-olds? Right. And so we, she said, is there anything like developmental about five-year-olds? And we, and I don't know of anything like that I've read in, you know, child development about five, but what we kind of decided was that when kids are five, they are so capable and they're so, they're so, they can have these big conversations with you and yeah. there's so much they can do and they're so independent that maybe our expectations of five are too high oh, because they're actually still quite little and their brains are still really developing. And five is really the, in terms of brain development, five is the beginning of developing impulse control and self-regulation. Right. So it's almost like there's this paradox between looking at this five-year-old, especially if you have a younger child, but looking at this kid and thinking, like, he seems so together in so many other ways. Yeah. Why is he still, like, so messy? Yeah. <laughs> so I think it I, – and I, and I remember when my kids were that age, my husband had a hard time with that that sort of expectation of, like, they can play chess with me and right. carry on a long conversation about, you know, astronomy, but they melt down, you know, at the, the littlest things. And so yeah. I think it's that contradiction. Yeah. And, you know, maybe for less intense kids, it's not as um, it's not as dramatic, but probably most of the people in my membership have more intense kids. So maybe yeah. that's why. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That totally resonates. Yeah, that totally makes sense. He's like so capable. So, yeah. So I think that, yeah, when I see the like more kind of like babyish behavior, I'm like, what? Like, so yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think it's just that contradiction that throws us off. We're like, wait, what? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Andrea. Thanks Thank for coming you. on. Yeah, and you, you and I know you've, you've made a lot of other parents today not feel so alone. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found this conversation insightful and exactly what you needed in this moment. Be sure to subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Remember that I'm rooting for you. I see you out there showing up for your kids and doing the best you can. Sending hugs over the airwaves today. Hang in there. You've got this.